right, let's stand and begin our worship service this morning. And I hope you're ready to sing, and I want you to smile, and I hope you got a little kick in your step. We're going to sing, What a Mighty God We Serve. Father God, we are grateful to be in a place of worship, Lord, with like believers, Lord. When we gather together as a family of faith, Lord, it's important, Lord. We, we bounce off of each other this energy that comes from loving you together. So I pray today, Lord, that we bring our, our, our private worship together today. And Lord, as we dive into this last sermon in a series about David, Lord, I pray for you just to, to take all that we've learned, Lord, and Lord God, that we incorporate it to become somebody, a person, after your own heart. So I pray today for that to happen, God. I ask you to touch us, Lord, to move in our life, to show us who you want us to be. And Father, that is the greatest form of worship. So God, let today be about you. Help us to, to, to brush away all the things that would distract us. Lord God, you are the one who has placed us as the apple of your eye in all of creation, Lord. And when you think about the grandeur of what you do, and then you chose to shine grace and mercy and honor on us, Lord. So help us to, to bask in that, Lord, but also to return it, Lord, because you are above all things. And, Lord, we bring ourselves to you to bow in worship. So let today be about you. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You be seated. Good to see you in Pickensville this morning. I pray that the Lord bless you. We got one more day of sunshine. Uh, we definitely need to be praying for our friends that are down south, but it looks like we might need to pray for our, us around here too. So please be in prayer this week. Keep those folks in your mind, okay? It's a great day of worship. Just a couple things to bring to your attention. This week is Potluck Supper. Amen. I, yep, I figured I'd get an amen. Potluck Supper, Wednesday night. It's always wonderful. Bring your favorites and come join us. And then we do, we eat at 6.30. We have Bible study right about 7. So I hope that you'll come and be a part of that, okay? Also, there's a note in there about the host and hostesses for our regular catered events. Uh, there's some sheets up front. And uh, so if you have any questions about that, you see my wife about it, okay? That's all I've got for announcements this morning. We like to recognize birthdays. Anybody? No birthdays? Oh, we have one, Miss Linda. It takes her a while to get up. Let's stand up. We're going to sing happy birthday to her, okay? Happy birthday and many more. You just got to go, don't you? Hey, hey. Hey, y'all time. Smile at somebody. Grin at them. Hey, y'all. Hey, y'all. Keep 
So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we pause right here in the middle of this because giving is part of worship. Lord God, when we give ourselves, Lord, that means that we are available when you need us in the streets, when you need us to speak, you need us to act a certain way. But Lord, also we give with our money. Lord, you have blessed us on high with the graciousness of all the wonderful things in our life. And Lord God, we ought to be a blessing to others. We ought to be investing in your kingdom. So Lord, I pray, give us that joyful heart, that cheerful heart that you talk about when we know that we give and we become an extension of, of, of your kingdom. So Lord, we pray for this money. Anoint it, do great things with it, expand its buying power. Lord, bless us as we give and bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated.
you, Parker. All right, as you can see from our splash screen up there, we are in our series on David, and actually you are here for the last day, okay? You are here for the last sermon in this, passing the torch to the next generation, passing the torch to the next generation. Uh, Gary Rogers tapped me on the shoulder when I was sitting up on the front pew, this kind of things he does to me, he says, you're going to read 1 Chronicles chapter 22 through 29? No, I'm not, Gary, so you can relax. I asked him, did he pack a snack lunch? So um, let's dive in, okay? I want to start in 1 Chronicles chapter 22, verse 1. Then David said, this is the house of the Lord God, and this is the altar of burnt offering for Israel. So David gave orders to gather the foreigners who were in the land of Israel, and he set stone cutters to hew out stones to build the house of God. David prepared large quantities of iron to make the nails for the doors of the gates and for the clamps and bronze that, and more bronze than could be weighed and timbers of cedar logs beyond number for the Sidonians and the Tyranians brought large quantities of cedar timber to David. David said, my son Solomon is young and inexperienced and the house that is to be built for the Lord shall be exceedingly magnificent famous and glorious throughout all the lands. Therefore now I will make preparation for it. So David made ample preparations before his death. Then he called for his son Solomon and charged him to build the house for the Lord God of Israel. David said to Solomon, my son, I had intended to build the house in the name of the Lord my God, but the word of the Lord came to me saying, you have shed much blood and have waged great wars. You shall not build a house to, to my name, because you have shed so much blood on the earth before me. Behold, a son will be born to you who shall be a man of peace, a man of rest, and I will give him rest from all of his enemies on every side, for his name shall be Solomon, and I will give peace and quiet to Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name, and he shall be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever." Now, my son, the Lord be with you that you may be successful and build the house of the Lord your God just as he has spoken concerning you. Only the Lord give you discretion and understanding and give you charge over Israel so that you may keep the law of the Lord your God. Then you will prosper if you are careful to observe the statutes and ordinance which the Lord commanded Moses considering Israel. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear nor be dismayed. So this summer, we had the Summer Olympics, and part of the tradition of those games is around the Olympic torch. I don't know if you realize this, but it goes back to ancient Greece, and in the times of ancient Greece, they would start the flame or fire, and they would keep it burning throughout the, all the games. It flamed out, pun intended, for a while, but in 1928, they reestablished that tradition and started the torch again, and interestingly enough, the tradition now is that they go to, mo to modern Greece and they transfer the torch to wherever is hosting the games, kind of a tradition that goes on. The carrying of the torch, I found this interesting, that that, that was started in all places of Nazi Germany in the 1936 Olympics, and, and just odd. But this year, the tradition continued over in Japan, and they faced a lot of problems. Most of it was because people were protesting that they didn't want the Olympics there because of the COVID virus, and there were all kinds of, like outside the city, Mitu, I think is the way you say it, Mitu in Japan, they had a lady come and attack the torchbearer with a water pistol, okay? She's trying to squirt it out with a plastic water pistol. But there's always been problems with keeping this torch lit. I remember distinctly back in Russia, because it kind of became a joke, in 2014 they hosted the Winter Olympics there, and when they did, that, the, the flame went out 44 times. 44 times. The most prominent time was that Putin came out and he was standing there with the torch and, and you know parading it around and he handed it to a runner who started into the Kremlin with it and it blew out when they ran in there. There happened to be a plainclothesman security guard there that walked up to it and saved the day with a pocket lighter. Can you imagine? The Olympic torch. He walked up, I got it, boss. I got it. Why all this torch talk? Well, because it's a good metaphor for life. 
You've heard this before. It's time to patch the torch. Torch. One generation passes what they they consider important, what is of value to them, on to the next generation. Of added significance is us as believers because we are to pass along the torch of our faith. The, the foundation and the, 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 the doctrine of what we believe and what we think is important. And each generation is responsible to pass that truth on to the next generation. God has not designed faith to be passed along genetically. Just because I'm a pastor, it doesn't do any good for my children. Just because you come to church, it doesn't do any good to your children. This is something that must be passed along with purpose. It must be passed along Personally, it must be passed along purposefully. That it gives thought that I want to make sure that my children know what I believe. My children have an idea about the foundation to the faith in this family. So it is our job to actively pass the torch. Actively pass the torch. It's been said, and I really feel this sometimes, and it kind of alarms me at times, that, that in America, we are only one generation away from having the torch go out. It's awful to think like that. So it's a good day for us to turn and to look at David this morning, to put a wrap on David's this study about David, a man after God's own heart. We've called it the king of hearts. We started this series on January the 10th, in case you're curious. So we've been there. This is the 25th sermon in all of this. So specifically today, we are going to see David pass the torch to his son Solomon. David had served faithfully in Israel. We've seen all the warts. We've seen all the bad things that David did. We've seen all the mistakes that David made. But yet, God continues to call him a man after his own heart. And how is that? Well, because we've seen David bounce back. And we've seen David, just like you, make mistakes knowing that that is wrong, recover from that with genuine repentance and come to God and say, I'm going to get this right and get back on path. So David has served for 40 years. He's getting, as we would say in the South, getting long in the tooth, okay? He's getting older. He recognizes his days are limited. So his days begin to count down. His heart turns to this transfer. It's a it's something that, first of all, is a king that he observes. He needs an orderly transfer. We don't need any mess. We don't need any problems, although there will be some. And we'll talk about that next week because I'm going to preach a tag on sermon about Joab, who we've been studying a lot, Joab. So we'll talk about Joab next week. But David wants to make sure that it, but, but more than that, layered on top of that, is that David wants to make sure that Solomon is headed in the right direction with his faith with his allegiance to God, his serving the Lord. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at some of these key things. He's about to pass the torch. So what are the key elements that you and I need to get as we talk about our children and our grandchildren? I think both apply, but also to those around us. We have a responsibility. If you love the Lord, you serve the Lord, you're a believer, say, I am. You have a responsibility to work on passing the torch, and we must do it actively, with purpose, with thought, okay? So what goes into this? And we'll give you three bullet points. First of all, there's preparation. Preparation. Makes no, <laughs> there's no secret about it. Children change us. <laughs> they change our priorities. They change our direction. Often, you know, from the day that children are born, you know, our, our thoughts begin to change, and we get to think about their future and what's facing them as they come in. You know, we, we, we come in, you know, a dad will show up at the delivery at the hospital, and he'll come in there with his favorite team's jersey, you know. They want to they wanna make sure that that kid knows what they believe, you know. I, I showed up at Jim's, my grandson, at his and when he was born, I showed up with a, a camo onesie, okay? I found it somewhere when I was traveling, so I got him a camo onesie and a cap, okay? That's what I got him. But new parents begin to think seriously about things that they hadn't thought much about before. Things like maybe life insurance or wheels or college education funding and all of those kind of things. Why? Because we... Children change our thinking. We want to make sure that they are prepared in case something were to happen to us, that they are prepared for the next step. We want to pass the torch. 
Certainly, David is no different than we are. David has been providing for his son all of his life. He's been working with him. But now in 1 Chronicles chapter 22, in a very specific way, he begins to provide for his son, Solomon. God had given David this vision, this vision to build the temple. But as we just read, David got that privilege pulled from him. It's because he was the man of bloodshed. He said, you're not the one to do it. But God gave him a, a very good note right after that. But your son is going to do it. You're going to have a son. You're going to name him Solomon. So I want him to build it. So David begins to prepare for this. I don't know if you noticed when I was reading that. David got all the supplies together. He began to get people who would send him things. You want to be King David's friend at this point in history. So people would send gifts, and they would send cedars and all of these things. So David got the supplies together. David got blueprints made. He got the building plan set together. He even included the interior design for the place. On top of that, he provides Solomon. We didn't read all of this with an organization structure about what it should look like inside. Now, God provides a lot of that instruction, but David is leaving nothing uncovered. David says, I want to make sure that he's ready. So get David's mindset. David knows that his job is not only to pass the sepulcher, but also to pass on the torch of faithfulness. So in his mind, he is doing both of those things. And his spiritual preparations for his son were more important to him than the physical ones, although he got those done. David has already left a legacy in the way that he lived. So David has shown us faithful living. He's shown godly character. But he also showed to Solomon how to get over when you fall. When you fall. It's going to happen. It happens to everybody. When failure and disappointment comes, what do you do with that? So David left him about how to handle difficult times as well. <laughs> Interesting thing to me is David also leaves him a whole collection of songs and faults. He left him his iTunes account, okay? He left him his iTunes account. We call it the Psalms today. So he left him all of that. It's got instruction in it. It's got great praise in it. It's got great worship in it. All of this begs this question I'm going to ask you today. What are you and I doing to pass on this godly heritage? What are you and I doing on purpose, with thought, doing to make sure the torch doesn't go out when we pass it to our children and our grandchildren? Are we working as hard to prepare them for eternity as we're working to get them prepared for college? Are we working as hard to prepare our children to gain a crown of life as we are to get them a starting position on the whatever team they're on? Are we working with our children and teaching them the importance of learning about Jesus Christ and about how important that faith is? And we're doing that through the way that we live. It begs that question. They're eternally important. So how do we go about that? I'll just give you two quick hints this morning. Number one is that we need to be deliberate about it. I keep hammering this on to you. Be deliberate about preparing your children. To parent with purpose. To grandparent with purpose. It begins by taking them to worship. Getting them engaged in Sunday school. Getting them engaged in other things that are going on in the church. To teach them the value of worship. The value of bringing yourself before a holy God and listening to the words. You don't use those terms. They'll check out on you. But you bring them before the Lord. Help them to understand about their relationship with the Lord, that it's personal, that it's not tied to a building, it's not tied to a person, it's not tied to a preacher. It's, it's a personal thing. And we teach that by the example. When we're out in the world versus we're in the church, you know, what kind of language do we use? What kind of activities are we involved in? How do we... How do we get out and how do we handle work situations? How do we, the choices that we make, all of those things, we'd be deliberate. But the second is that we'd be diligent. We'd be diligent. Uh, listen, the most amazing teacher in your child's life is the way that you're living your life. The way that you're living your life. Not what you say, not what you write down, not that you bring them to church. It's the way that you live your life. 
You've got to be diligent to be a genuine follower in your own life. Your children and your grandchildren are paying attention whether you realize it or not. Other folks are paying attention whether you realize it or not. Amen? I came across a couple of pictures. Back when uh, Jim was a little guy, he doesn't know that they're in here, when Jim was a little guy, I, I, I put these up, and number one, he found my reading glasses. So show him that one. There he is. He's grown up a little bit, hasn't he? So there's Jim. He hadn't even seen the picture, so he put them all. And that was cute, you know, he's being like Pop. But you know what really made me think he was paying attention? Show him the next one. He hooked them in his shirt. I do it all the time. I do it all the time. I do that, right? My reading glasses. I hook them in my shirt. He's a little guy. I don't know how old he is there, but he's a little guy but he's paying enough attention to know Pop wears his glasses, but Pop also hooks them in his shirt. It was kind of unnerving. You know, they're watching, is my point. They're paying attention. And if they pay attention to the way that you wear your glasses, guess what? They're paying attention to the way you treat the girl at the drive in. They're paying attention to how you talk to the teacher, about how you talk about the church, or you talk about the place of work, or all of those things. They are all there. Mm. They're watching. So preparation is one thing in David's transferring of the torch. Next one is instruction. Instruction. The words of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 and 5 are, are fairly familiar to us, okay? Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your might. Those are important words to us, but they were even more important to the nation of Israel. Those are called the Shema. They were the most important text of it to Israel. Do you know what follows that? I'll, I'll read it to you. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6. These words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. That's pretty much all the time, right? That's what he means. All the time. You shall bind them as a sign on your, fore, on your hand, and they shall be as a frontal on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gate. I want the ordinance of God to be everywhere. That's what God's saying. The Bible tells us it is important to instruct our children in the ways of the Lord. It's important that kids grow up in church. You know that I've said that a million times. But I want to tell you, the best spiritual training course in America, in the world, is not the church. It's at your house. It's at your house. The church takes it, 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 it takes it, the responsibility important to, to teach and to give foundation. But guys, there is nothing that compares to your interaction with the children around you, to the next generation around you. Nothing compares to the flow of life. That's the way I'm going to define it. The flow of life. You know what the flow of life is? Is that, that, that you know, when you're spending time with them, with, with Jim, with my kids, we spend an awful lot of time hunting and fishing, you know? Hunting and fishing. And Jim, I'm doing the same thing with Jim. You just cannot imagine what a fertile ground of education a four-by-four plywood box can be when you go hunting. Amen? One of the great lessons of that four-by-four box is Doritos are loud. Okay? They are really, really loud. When you're trying to wait on a deer and they're crunching them and all the pack. But, but that's what I'm talking about, the flow of life. The flow of life is in all contexts of your life, all settings of your life. Take advantage of this flow that I'm talking about, and you teach them that, hey, the decisions you make in your life determine the destination of your life. They determine who you are, what you become. I think about the average young person today. What is it? You get, you, first of all, they got the earplugs in, they're listening to stuff all the time, and they're watching reality television. They're, they're keeping up with their friends through TikTok and Snapchat and all of those different things. They're watching videos on YouTube. Now, Jim's into that, watches those videos of other kids playing games. Never really got that. But anyway, they're text messaging. They're doing all these things. And they are bombarded by all of this information just coming at them from all different ways. 
And a lot of it is ungodly, and a good portion of it is just downright perverse. I'll be honest with you. You need to monitor what your kids are doing online. I've seen some of your kids online. You don't want to see it. The notion, here's where I'm going with it, the notion that an hour of Sunday school and an hour of worship, it can combat that, it's, it's just naive that we can counter that. The church is here. It is vital. But parents, you must instruct your children. As I listen to David in this heartfelt way, this urgency about him, this aging parent, 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 9, as for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will let you find him. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. Consider now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. Be courageous and act Two directives, David says, you need to acknowledge God. You need to, you need to make sure that you recognize that he has given you all of this, that he is the blesser of your life. You need to recognize, not in a sense of, David isn't telling Solomon to know God in a theological way or in a, a, a text way that you would go about a textbook. He's telling him about an actual personal relationship with God. Know him, know him. There is a difference between children coming to church because that's what they're supposed to do or that's what they've been told to do to when they turn that corner and they want to be there because they have a relationship with the Lord and they want to honor him and they want to serve him. That's a huge difference. It's the difference between being the socially acceptable thing and the life-changing thing. That is the difference between those. See, our job is not simply to affirm our faith in our children. It's for them to embrace the faith themselves. It's not an easy thing. It's not something we can automatically do. So he says, make sure that you, you, you instruct them. You, you make sure that, you, you tell, that they acknowledge God, and that they know that they can find him to be the only true way the only true truth and the only true life. And he says also to serving. David didn't say serve the Lord like some bumper sticker. Man, we get lots of bumper stickers. Or maybe a better way in our, our age group is uh, we do Facebook and everybody's, everybody, I see people all the time that got these godly things that they put up on Facebook. I ain't never seen them in church. Or not, 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 not my church. I'm not talking about my church. Any church. And they just, they, but they throwing them up. They got the bumper sticker up. That's not what David's talking about. David's not talking about the bumper sticker on his favorite chariot. He's not talking about some or, ornate picture that he puts over his golden toilet in the palace restroom. He's not talking about that stuff. He's talking about a wholeheartedness, serving with your whole heart, with a genuine faith. David had many flaws and many problems in his life, but this is the way that he lived. Instruction and action go together. They must be there together. And you can only wholeheartedly serve one thing in your life. It is very definition of the word whole. You can have lots of interest. You can have lots of things that, that you put energy into. You can be committed to several different op, uh, hobbies or, or maybe whatever. But you can only wholeheartedly be devoted to one thing. David said, son, please make sure that you wholeheartedly serve the Lord. The one thing that you put above everything else, all other things, what is your wholehearted thing? Is it a hobby? Is it sports? Is it your career, your appearance, your position in life, your status? Again, David says, son, you need to recognize that the direction that you choose determines where you end up. What you commit your life to, what you say, this is mine, this is my wholehearted devotion, whatever that is, that's who you become. David impressed upon his son that if you sought the Lord, if you seek the Lord with all of your heart, your wholehearted, you will find him. He will not turn you away. He will not. Oh, but if you ignore him, the dangers of those ways are before you too because he will ignore you. David lived through those times as well. 
He knows what he's talking about. And he says, if you serve him wholeheartedly, you will find him. But if you don't, you won't find him. And I think about lots of people who, who work through their life and they end up with lots of stuff. And David says, don't be that person, wholeheartedly certain. Because even if you end up with a, an estate worth millions, even if you end up with a trophy room the size of Texas, or you end up with a funeral that they have to rent out an auditorium for you to have your service, all of that is for naught. If you have not served the Lord, if you have not given your life to the Lord. It's interesting to me that Solomon wrote about this later in life. In the book of Ecclesiastes, he goes after life looking under the sun. And the idea is without God in the picture. And he goes through and he looks at all these things. And he, 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 he looked at life from the terms of pleasure. He looked at it from academia, from material wealth. All of, and you know what his end result was? Vanity. Vanity. Meaningless. Meaningless. It's not that those things aren't temporarily entertaining. They are. And they're not pleasing, they are. If they weren't pleasing, they wouldn't be temptations. But Solomon followed the instruction that his father gave him. He served the Lord, but he looked at the world without God in it, and he says, there's nothing there. There's nothing there. It leads to emptiness. It leads to loss. We've seen this played out in, 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 in popular cultural figures forever. I think about Elvis. I remember when Elvis died, my mama cried. Okay, I can tell you. Elvis died, my mama cried. But the way of that life led to emptiness. More recently, if you remember Heath Ledger, who played Joker in the Batman, just this wonderful talent. Gone. Probably one of the most famous ones is Michael Jackson. You remember the pop, I mean, he's a pop icon. They didn't get any bigger than Michael Jackson. And he was taking lethal doses to get, of medicine just to sleep. And it eventually killed him. He went after everything. He seemed to have it all. If you sat on the mountaintop and you look down at those people, you think, they got it all. And Solomon would whisper in their ear, it's meaningless. It's meaningless. You serve him with all of your heart, son. So we see that David says that preparation is important, instruction is important. But I like this last one, and I've and I got to keep with my shuns here, petition. You could, so in the note, you can write petition or you can write prayer. I don't care. You're probably not as hung up on a shun as I am. Petition. I'm going to 1 Chronicles 29 for this one. There David prays to God for his son. I want you to hear this prayer, okay? I want you to hear it as a dad, a, a parent, praying for their child. First of all, I want you to recognize how much time he spends on how great God he is. But then he turns and he prays for it. Do you pray for your children? Do you pray for the people around you like this? Listen to this. I'm going to read a while, okay? Let's go down to verse 10. So David blessed the Lord in the sight of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, O Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and the earth, yours is dominion, O Lord, and you exalt yourself as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you roll over all, and, your hand is, and in your hand is power and might, and it lies in your hand to make great and to strengthen everyone. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and we praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are the, my people that we should be able to offer generously as this? For all things have come from you, and from your hand we have given you. For we are sojourners before you, and have tenants, as all of our fathers were. Our days on earth are like a shadow, and there is no hope. O oh Lord our God, all this abundance that you, we have provided to build you a house for your holy name. It is from your hand and all is yours. We collected it, God, but it's all yours. Since I know, oh my God, that you try the heart and delight in uprightness, I, in the integrity of my heart, have willingly offered all things. So now, with joy, I have seen your people who are present here make their offerings willingly to you. 
O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our Father, preserve this forever in the intentions of your heart, of your people, and direct their heart to you. And give to my son Solomon a perfect heart to keep your commandments, your testimonies, and your statutes, and to do them all, and to build the temple for which I have made provision. Then David said to all the assembly, Now bless the Lord your God. And all the assembly blessed the Lord, the God of their fathers, and bowed low and did homage to the Lord and to the king. Above all, I think David understands the importance of intermission, of praying, to get involved in the prayer battle, the spiritual warfare for the sake of your children and your grandchildren and everybody of importance around you. There is a battle going on for the soul of our children. I look on the news this morning. I try to get up every morning. Uh, I try to do this every morning. I go to the news channels, and I don't dive into everything, but I just go to several of them just to see what the headlines are for the day. If, if California fell into the ocean, I want to know about it kind of thing, okay? So, so I, I go through this thing. Well, one of them stuck out at me this morning, and it's about a teacher out in California, and they're doing the pre Pledge of Allegiance. And she says, well, I don't make the children say, stand up or, or do whatever. Uh, I don't make them look at the flags because I took the flag out and I don't know what I did with it. And so I let them stand up and if they want to say it, they can. And they didn't do it. And, and one kid says, well, it sounds funny for me to say the words if there's not a flag up. And she says, well, and she looked around the room and she had a gay flag, a gay pride flag up there. And she says, well, there's your flag you can... I want to say, are you nuts? No matter what your belief is, that is just totally strange, right? Just totally weird. I mean, that, that, those things don't equate, but that is the world that we live in. It is a weird world, amen? You and I need to realize that we need to engage in this battle of spiritual warfare by prayer. By prayer. Praying, lifting up. It begins on the knees. We pray for our children when they hit a crisis. We often do that. Oh, they had a bad day at school. A little Johnny's friend uh, bopped him on the nose. He'll be all right, okay? I, we did have all, and we'll pray for them when a crisis hits. Listen to me. We need to pray for them all the time. We need to pray that the crisis doesn't come. We need to lift them up before the God. Every day, your children are making critical decisions about who they're going to be and who their wholehearted devotion is going to fall toward. Every single day. I'm telling you guys, there's some things that are happening. Only prayer can turn a, a, a child's heart toward the Lord. Shelter them from unseen disaster. Only prayer can lead them to wisdom in making decisions. Only prayer can strengthen them to stand on their convictions. Only prayer can help them to learn to live the life that God wants them to live. You've you got to be praying for your children. Add this to your prayer list. to Expand their life. To, to pray for their character and their spiritual development, to be praying for those things. David wanted his children to have a heart for God. He prayed that. And you and I need to pray that. Mm. So that's where we leave, David. That's where we leave. This guy who has made the past passing of the torch. But I want to spend some time, as you see, we've got 10 minutes and five more points. I know how you keep score. Amen? I know how you do it. He's going to be here. We're going to be here forever. We only made it through three of eight. You know, I know how your rhyme works. But what I want to do is just go back. Let's pick up some lessons, okay? We're going to pick up some lessons that we've got through the oh, last six months or whatever. No, it's the eight months. What it means to live with the heart of God, Okay? So we've seen that David is challenging to our faith. I have found that. I don't know about you. I found great comfort in this study. and Maybe that's because I live in my own bubble, but I hope it has blessed you. But now we find him at the end of his life, and when we're looking back, he's about to pass this on. What are some things that we find about him? Well, first of all is this, is that we can't live with the heart of God until we made a true commitment to him. You need to commit yourself to the Lord. Commit yourself to the Lord. You know what the contrast, we began early in David, the contrast between Saul and David. You remember the whole thing? Saul's chasing him, Saul's trying to kill him, all this stuff. You know what the difference in those two people is? I look back on them, is that 
Saul served God only in name, where David served him with his heart. And you know what that made a difference with? Is that Saul went around trying to keep from offending God. He just trying to keep God off of his back. That's kind of the way Saul was. I just want to make sure I don't do the wrong thing so that I get punished. David tried to do honor to the Lord. There is a difference. Do you know that? We need to teach our children that, that the way to approach a relationship with God is not to be afraid of him or afraid you're going to make him mad or anything. That is not it at all. That's the way Saul was. David was different. I'm just going to serve him with all my heart. I'm going to do whatever I can. I'll make mistakes. I know I will, but I'm going to try to please him, and I want to try to make him happy. I just want to do what gives him the greatest honor. That is a true difference, a true commitment. Too many Christians in our churches have a Saul-like approach to serving God. I just don't want to make you mad. Would you like that relationship with your child? They couldn't come in and talk to you about anything close to them. I just don't want to make them mad. Just let me get... You know. I don't want that kind of relationship. I want, I want them to be open. Too many people are Saul-like. They just serve God when it's convenient to them. They get into trouble. It's, it, frankly, it's unacceptable to the King of kings and Lord of lords for you to live. He wants you to love him. He loved you. So how do you approach this? Are we committed to the Lord or are we just playing games with this thing? A second thing I learned out of David's life is that the person who lives with the heart of God never forgets that he is a recipient of grace. Recipient of grace. In that last prayer that we lit, could you not get that as he talked to God? Oh, God, we've collected all this stuff, and it's yours. How are you being so gracious to God, us, God? How are you allowing us to be the ones to worship to you? God, this final public prayer, he says, everything's from you. You know what? It change your life, friend, if you'll live your life with gratitude. With gratitude. Well, you don't know what's happening here. You don't, I have to wear that stupid mask, or I have to do this, all right? We complain about something all the time. Well, that blesses God's heart, doesn't it? He's poured this life out on you. You get to live in this country. Your house is extravagant. It has air, has clean water, it has all of these things, and we just take it all for granted. Oh, <laughs> it's a good thing I ain't got, because I'd bop you on the head. That's what I'd do. I'd bop you on the head. All that we have is a gift from God. It is not a right. It is a gift from God. We therefore should live with humility and with gratitude. Number three, the person who lives with the heart of God focuses on the big picture. Big picture. <laughs> Do you know that when David, let's go back, David stood before Goliath. He was not focused on the giant in armor. He was focused on almighty God who rules the universe. Big picture. Whatever your giant is this week, get back, step back, and say, I want to serve you, Lord. No matter how I, this works out. When David was fleeing from Saul, later fled from Absalom, all those things, he learned to trust in the Lord. There were times he acted harshly and it didn't go well, but he learned to trust the Lord, to wait, to be patient, to have a big picture, to have, here it is, confidence in God's character. Confidence in God's character. If we're going to have the heart of God, instead of looking at our each individual struggle, we need to focus on the goal. God is making me more Christ-like. He is driving me to a different place. When I, instead of focus on the mountains, I need to focus on the mountain mover. Now, well, I should, the mountain maker and the mountain mover, okay? Instead of dwelling and focusing on what we see and what we feel, we go to the one who is unseen and who is eternal, and we say, I trust you. I trust you. In any relationship, trust builds over time in the course of events. Things happening in our life brings us closer and closer together. I hope that's for your relationship with the Lord. From the joys and the sorrows, and you experience those together. That's the way married life works. It's the way church works. We in here, I've, I've been here so long. I've married some of your folks off. I've buried a lot of your folks. We've seen babies born. We've seen all those things. Those things bring community. It brings family. And God wants that kind of relationship with you. We do this by by learning to trust Him in everyday events. How do we do that? 
forth. The person who lives with the heart of God cares more about God's reputation than their own. <laughs> Boy, we live in a society that's all about me. You know that? And we get caught up in it. Time and time again, David was confronted with the choice between doing what was right and doing what God wanted and versus what was popular. What will make me look good to the people? What will make me more prosperous? What will make me living with the heart of God seems that sometimes we disappoint the world, amen? Sometimes we disappoint ourselves because we want God to get the glory and the honor. Learning to obey in the little things makes me available and makes me able to be obedient in the big stuff. The day-to-day work. Daily, daily compromises in your life are like termites. You don't see them working, but they're working. And before you know it, a floor joist is gone. And before you know it, the foundation you live on is gone. Number five, living with the heart of God doesn't mean that we won't fall. <laughs> Amen. Anybody in here falling? Yeah. But it does mean that when we fall, we get up and we get right <laughs> with God as quickly. Get up and get right. Say that. Get up and get right. I like that, okay? <laughs> Through David's faults and many, many weaknesses, he goes to known to show us that a man after God's own heart is not perfect, but he does not stay in his sin. He does not linger there. He does not love there. He does not like it there. He wants to get out of that. We all fall on occasion. We all will. The measure of it will be how long do we wallow in that sin? How long do we linger with our excuses? About, well, you don't know what happened. Listen to me. David quit making excuses and he started living for the Lord. Get up and get right. Finally, living with the heart of God means finishing strong. Finishing strong. If you've ever seen kids, little kids play baseball, all right? You with me? Play baseball. One of the things that drives coaches nuts when they're little and learning how is that they'll run to first. We'll say that chair is first base. And they'll be, man, they hit the ball, they'll be sprinting. I'm going to do it in slow motion. <laughs> and they'll be sprinting, and they'll get to first, and they'll stop on it. Don't they? They all do it. And that coach, and what happens is the kid hits it, shortstop kicks it to the second baseman, the second baseman rolls it back to the pitcher, pitcher picks it up, and that kid's running. He should be, he should be safe by a mile. But what does he do? He stops right here, and then he takes about another step. Coach said, run through the base. Run through the base. Finish strong. Keep running. That is the idea here. We, oftentimes we sprint, but we tend to, as we get older, to begin to back off. And we begin to, to pull back. And we begin to pause. Don't pause, friend. Run through the base. Work hard at all of those things. Your life has been about passing the torch. Don't stop now. Don't stop now. Those who live with the heart of God may or may not have material wealth, but they have this imprint of faith in them, this imprint that is unmistakable, it's unforgettable, and it is eternal. It is eternal. It is the only eternal thing that you have to leave is the torture of your faith, the torture of your faith. And by God's wonderful grace, May our torches stay lit and may we finish strong so that not just my children but my grandchildren and everybody that I have an influence and imprint upon will find the faith for their life and for their eternity. Run through the base. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this word this morning. Lord, it's been wonderful to watch David in action. Sometimes it's been painful and it's been like, what? A man of God did that? But through it all, Lord, we see this man at the end of his life passing a torch of faith. And Lord, it, it's impressive. And in the end, his final prayer is he says, it's all about you. So help us, Lord, to embrace that spirit, that image. Help us to be torch bearers, but also torch passers. And Father, I pray for this group in here to finish well. Now is not the time to slow down. It's the time to sprint past the base, Lord. I pray that we find you every day of our life. 
in a fresh and a new way. God, we love you, but we know that that's only because you love us and you open up this, this, this ability to step into your throne room. God, thank you for your availability. And Lord, help us make us more willing. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You stand up. We're going to sing. Yeah.